In this video, we're going to talk about developing flow in a pipe, fully developed flow, and the pressure distribution that results in a pipe flow in each of those cases. Here we have a pipe flow. Imagine that we have a constant velocity profile coming into the pipe flow. Black is our pipe, and let's imagine we don't see this yet. As that flow enters the pipe, we have the no-slip condition on the wall, and so we start to see this profile changing as we go into the pipe. As we move further, further along the pipe, we'll see further changes, further changes, and further changes until we get to a certain point where we do not see changes in that velocity profile anymore. If I connect these lines, here is where this velocity profile starts, and it's visualized with these vectors and we see this profile. So if I go back from this point to here, this represents the point where we see changes in the velocity. In between that point, we have a constant uh, velocity profile still. And so it's not drawn perfectly, but it's close to that. If we connect all of those lines, we'll see that connecting these lines, we'll get to a point where these two lines meet. And after that point, the velocity profile will no longer be changing down the profile. The, the, the effect of the wall has propagated all the way to the center, and we see the velocity profile staying the same. Well, that region, until we hit that point where the velocity profile is no longer changing, is called the developing flow region or the entrance region. And that region after the velocity profile is no longer changing is called the fully developed flow. Okay, let's look at the developing flow region in our pipe. First thing we notice is that we have the no-slip condition, and therefore we have zero velocity at the walls. So we have the zero velocity everywhere at the walls, and when we have the plug flow entering the pipe, we have a very quick change where it goes to zero. And as we move down in the flow direction, the region which has been affected by this no-slip condition gets larger and larger until it, it covers the whole section of the pipe when we get to the end of the developing flow region. Now this region in between where the effect of the wall is not yet felt, where we see a straight line here, um, can be called the inviscid core, and it's inviscid because there's no velocity gradient here. If you remember, the shear stress is equal to the viscosity times a strain rate or a derivative of the velocity, and the derivative of the velocity with respect to radius or position in the pipe here is zero when we have a constant. So we can call this, this region the inviscid core. And obviously, as, the, as this region is growing, the inviscid core is shrinking until there is no inviscid core once we get to the end of the developing flow region. And if we think about conservation of mass, we can see that if we look at this section of the profile here, we have much smaller velocities than when we had a constant value out here, and therefore there is less mass flow in this part of the profile than there was in this profile. Of course mass is conserved, the same amount of mass must pass through at this point here, and therefore the maximum velocity here has to be in the inviscid core has to be larger than it is here. Following along, we see that this the value, the velocity of this inviscid core is, in, is increasing as we move down the pipe, and it'll reach a maximum when we get to the end of the developing flow region. If we think about Bernoulli, that means the flow in this inviscid core is accelerating, and therefore we must see we must see that the pressure is decreasing as we accelerate that flow, and we'll look at that in more detail in a moment. In addition, I can look at this and say the momentum leaving a control volume is greater than the momentum entering a control volume. If I integrate the momentum across this profile, it's greater than it is when I integrate the momentum across this profile. And so the momentum leaving a control volume is larger in the developing flow region. We'll see that again in greater detail as well. In fact, that's how we could show that the Bernoulli effect is there, that the momentum leaving is greater, and therefore the pressure must be lower in order to compensate. And also, we can also see that the velocity profile at the wall, if I look at the slope of this profile at the wall, it is decreasing. And if it's decreasing, that means that the wall shear stress is decreasing along the flow direction. So we'll have a maximum in the wall shear stress at the beginning of the pipe when we go suddenly from this velocity to zero, and that wall shear stress will decrease as we move down along that pipe. Just as a reminder, there's the expression for the wall shear stress. It's the viscosity times the velocity gradient in the radial direction evaluated at the wall, so what I've sketched in here. Let's think now about the developing flow region, and let's go back and recall module 5 where we did integral momentum analysis. Let's draw the control volume, as I've shown in red here, 
And let's add to it the forces that we have on this. At section one, where the flow is coming into this pipe, we have a pressure, which is acting on my control volume as I've drawn here at P1. The end of the developing flow region, we have our profile, which is no longer changing. There is no longer an inviscid core. And we have a pressure, which is going to be smaller, which is acting in that direction. We will also have these wall shear stresses acting on the surface of this control volume. We just saw how we evaluate. And we can evaluate this and understand how the pressure is changing uh, during in this developing flow region. Let's look at this again. If I now fill in my integral conservation momentum equation, I have the pressure 1 times the cross-sectional area minus the pressure 2 times the cross-sectional area minus, we know this shear stress is changing as we move along here, so I have to write the integral of the wall shear stress times the perimeter of my cross-section dx, which is the area that this is acting on, the surface area of this wall, whatever the perimeter of that cross-section is, times the length of that little section. So that will be my wall shear stress, and it's acting in against the flow direction. And of course that's equal to the rate the momentum is carried in, minus the rate the momentum is carried in, plus the rate the momentum is carried out. Now if you recall, first I can simplify this and put this in the way we normally do at delta p. Delta 2 is p2 minus p1, and so this will be minus delta p. I can cheat my shear stress and just say, yeah, it's the average shear stress. I'll put a tau wall bar and say it's the average. I've carried out that integral times the area of that wall. And if you go back and look at the material for the momentum correction factor, you can see it's very easy to evaluate uh, the momentum coming in when it's a constant velocity. It will be rho times that constant velocity squared times the cross-sectional area. But we also integrated this profile for a parabola in that, and that's where we had our momentum correction factor, which was 4 thirds for laminar flow. And so we know that in this case, right up to the end, that we have 4 thirds rho u average squared times the cross-sectional area. And I can simplify that and solve for the negative of my uh, delta p. I see that I have the average wall shear stress times a wall over the, the area of the cross-section plus this one-third rho u squared average, which u squared average, which comes from the changing momentum in and out of my control volume. Now, if I think about this again, now I have an expression for the delta p, and I see that I have this average wall shear stress. If I looked at a section here, this average wall shear stress is going to be larger than if I looked at a section here. We know that the wall shear stress is decreasing as we move in this direction because we saw that that slope of the velocity profile was decreasing as we moved across that way. We also know that if I took a section, a control volume that was, say, here, and I started with a profile that was almost fully developed to this fully developed one, this wouldn't be the full one-third. It would be smaller than the one-third because the one-third is coming from comparing this fully undisturbed profile to this right at the end of the developing region profile. So this value is also decreasing if we take a control volume here compared to a control volume here this value is also decreasing. So that's telling us that we'll have the largest pressure drops at the beginning of our pipe, and they will decrease as we move down the pipe. Now let's look at the fully developed region. Our integral momentum equation, again, is going to tell us that the sum of the forces is the rate that the momentum is minus the rate that the momentum is carried in, plus the rate that the momentum is carried out. But by definition, when it's fully developed, these profiles are identical, and therefore, these two things are identically equal, and they cancel out, and we're left with the sum of the forces is equal to zero, or we have a static situation. The pressure forces are going to balance the wall shear forces, and that's what we see here. If I write that as I had it before, I can divide that by the length here to get a pressure gradient, uh, and I get that length by saying that my wall area is equal to whatever the perimeter of my cross-section is times L. So I'll get that by changing A wall into P times L, and I'll see that this is equal to tau wall times the perimeter divided by AC, the cross-sectional area. And that explicitly gives me an expression for my pressure gradient, delta P over L, and of course it's a constant. 
tau wall is not changing because we have a fully developed profile that's proportional to this slope at the wall. If the profile is not changing, the slope at the wall isn't changing, the perimeter of my cross section isn't changing, and the cross sectional area isn't changing, and so this will be a constant value in the fully developed region. Okay, so now let's look and let's finish this up by looking at the pressure distribution. We just saw that the pressure gradient, the delta P over L, any length that I choose in this developing in this fully developed region is going to be a constant. And so we'll see, we know that the pressure is dropping along the flow direction and the gradient is constant. That means I have a straight line pressure distribution. If we think about all the things we thought about in the entrance region, we can easily extend this curve and see that it has to be drawn like this. It has to match the gradient in the fully developed region, but the shear stress contribution is increasing as we go towards the beginning of the flight, at the beginning of the pipe, sorry, and so is the change in momentum going from this profile to this profile. So both of those effects are resulting in the pressure gradient increasing, or we have proportionately larger pressure drops in the entrance regions, which ultimately match and reach a constant value of pressure drop. And I can also look at this and say, well, if I extrapolate this line, this constant line back to the axis here, what I can see is that I have an extra pressure drop due to entrance effects. So the entrance will give me, the entrance effects will give me a larger pressure drop than once I reach the fully developed flow region. Of course, if you remember back to the introductory video and see those very long pipe runs in almost all practical piping situations, if this, if this, if this region extends for tens or even hundreds of meters, then of course the pressure drop is going to be dominated by this overall. And when I draw it funny like this with the entrance region being much larger than the fully developed region, this looks like a large amount. But in a very, very large pipe run, this region is going to be negligible. The entrance region is going to be negligible compared to the drop that we get. And we'll think about that as we go on to calculating the actual uh, numerical values for pressure drops that we have in the pipe. So in the next videos we'll be looking at how to calculate what pressure drops we get uh, for our various pipe flows.